So uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the uh, Surgical Grand Rounds. Actually, this um, this this talk or this this speaker has been a long time coming. Uh, Dr. Palutz and I run into each other in the hallways of the Montreal General quite often, um, and it's uh, it's really been uh, very interesting to hear about some of the work that he's doing. <laughs> just just give me five minutes. Before, no, before. Look, look, Mama's talking now. I need one minute. I apologize, everybody. <laughs> My husband's out of town, so. <laughs> um, so Dr. Falutz is going to be presenting to us about frailty and surgery in the elderly, which is a topic I think that's relevant to all of us, um, and uh, and some of the work that he's been doing in the area. Uh, many of you know Dr. Falutz. He's an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Geriatrics uh, at the MUHC. Uh, his research interests uh, are on the management of older surgical patients and persons aging with HIV. Uh, and his goals include the development, one moment, my love, interdisciplinary uh, geriatric surgical program. Oh, my attentions are, this is like, thank you. I apologize. Please go ahead and uh, thank you for being here. And I'm really sorry. <laughs> no worries. All good. We all have, we all have these things. <clears throat> good morning, everyone. And thank you very much for this opportunity to to share with you some recent developments, new thinking, and some ideas concerning um, the management of our, of our most vulnerable um, patients. So what I'll be doing this morning, we're gonna start off with uh, presenting two um, very relevant cases. And then I'm gonna briefly go over <clears throat> some background, uh, which I'm sure you're very aware of, the aging surgical population and how to do risk assessment and then focus in on frailty and surgical outcomes in the elderly. I'm going to show we're going to show you some very preliminary results of a retrospective analysis that we did, focusing on hip fracture uh, patients um, assessed uh, in 2020 at the MGH, and then um, <clears throat> finish off with uh, some ideas about um, management strategies. So I'll let Dr. Pavoni begin with the first case. All right, so the first case is an 81-year-old male who presented to the ER with a fall on the middle of the night and a secondary left hip fracture. Um, he's from home with his wife, known for major neurocognitive disorder for the last few years um, with suspected Lewy body dementia. Only medications are a rivastigmine patch, and he takes catiapine regularly. Next slide. And he's completely dependent on his wife for all his IADLs and most of his ADLs. They have no CLSC services because the wife refused and she's managing everything. Um, he has no previous falls, but he has the clear kind of Parkinsonian shuffling gait, no gait aid. And his cognitive um, functioning um, has been declining over the last few years. He has an x-ray of the left femur that shows a femoral neck fracture. And he goes to OR a few days later with a post-op course that's complicated by aspiration pneumonia, recurrent um, orthostatic hypotension, he isn't mobilizing, he's not eating, and eventually he refuses to eat altogether and he's transitioned to level of care D and passes away um, about a month later. So his CFS score or clinical frailty scale score um, at baseline is seven, so he's severely frail. And the second case is a nine-year-old female who presents to the ER after she falls, trips on a power cord, and has a secondary left hip fracture. Um, she's from home alone and only known for hypertension, osteoporosis, and remote fall, only on one medication, hydrochlorothiazide. And she's completely independent for ADLs and IADLs, still quite active, shoveling snow in the winter, um, has a remote fall, but doesn't use a walking aid, has no cognitive impairment, and her x-ray shows a periprosthetic uh, left femoral fracture. So she goes to OR a few days later, and her post-op course is completely uncomplicated, no delirium. She was mobilizing right, right away on post-op day one, um, and she's discharged about 10 days later, but could have left sooner due to the holidays um, and the fact that she needed to leave with her sister that was a bit delayed. Um, but overall, her uh, frailty score, it was a CFS score of um, two. So she was non-frail at baseline. Thank you very much, Dr. Pavoni. All right. So I, I obviously it'll come no surprise to you that 
many or most of the patients that uh, are seen in surgery are older patients. <clears throat> Over the age of 65, the demographics in um, resource-rich countries show that the population over 65 is the most is the fastest growing group and in fact those over 80 and 85 are the are the most rapidly growing group of that segment um, of the population and obviously there's been a huge um interest in geriatric surgery and issues related to co-management delirium uh, etc and the the spike in publications over the last 20 years has been just um enormous if you like, take a look at some of the <clears throat> subspecialties, you'll see that uh, for many, certainly here the, uh, at, the, at the MUHC, the majority of the patients that you are involved with are over the age of 65. Again, the most vulnerable <clears throat> really being those over the age of 80. So the big question um, in surgery, uh, for example, not only in emergency surgery, but I thought that this uh, this paper by Bilal Joseph, who's one of the key um, thought leaders in surgical management of the elderly. The question is, are older patients too old or too frail for um, to manage um, surgically? So that's what we're going to discuss. So <clears throat> I want to show you the one-year mortality following major surgery by uh, stratified by various demographic characteristics. The type of surgery really, really is, has no significant impact on the mortality, neither does sex or um, race and ethnicity. Obviously, non-elective emergency versus elective surgery uh, uh, has different uh, impact on, on mortality, one way or mortality, and as well, whether the older patient is demented or not is itself an independent predictor of um, poor outcome. And we know that age by itself is clearly a risk factor for um, poor outcome, but it's it's more uh, nuanced and frailty status, again, regardless of how we define it, I'm going to get into that, frailty is a much better predictor of many uh, perioperative and postoperative uh, surgical outcomes compared to um, age. And I'll show you evidence to support this. For example, there's there's a number of different frailty metrics. We're going to be referring to them. <clears throat> the, uh, the clinical frailty score predicted one-year post-op mortality better than either age alone or the ACE score um, in this um, study in um, of orthopedic um, patients. And another metric, the frailty index, produced a failure to return home from post-operative um, hip fractures better than either the a British uh, metric referred to as the Nottingham hip fracture score or a mental status score. So um, frailty uh, certainly appears to have better predictive uh, value than the usual metrics that we use. What this leads us to understand is that um, there's heterogeneity and aging, and we differentiate between chronological age and biological age. So chronological age is a poor surrogate of aging. Possible biological markers include, there's much uh, work going on in this, which I'm, we're not going to uh, detail at all this morning, but epigenetic clocks, uh, telomere length, composite biomarkers, and frailty are felt to be important um, surrogates of biological um, age. So what is frailty? This is a condition initially described in the elderly. It's a state of increased vulnerability. That is its main um, aspect it, uh, to biological environmental stressors, which leads to increased risk of comorbidities, disability, and mortality. And what it really refers to is the loss of ability to maintain um, a system homeostasis in response to a variety of stressor. It's related to decreased physiological reserve in multiple organ systems, not one um, system itself, not cardiac, not renal, et cetera, but decreased partially age-related um, decline in physiological reserve and, and the ability to respond to um, various stressors and the, ability, the lack of ability to maintain system homeostasis. And there's a clear association with uh, an underlying chronic inflammatory state. So we just briefly look at the um, underlying pathogenesis for physical frailty, 
we see that there's underlying inflammation which contributes, which then itself contributes to comorbidity uh, and to decreased physical activity. But this leads to wasting and sarcopenia, which is an important contributor to the development of frailty, which then feeds back and itself increases development of new morbidities and to decrease um, physical uh, activity. It's important to uh, understand that frailty is not synonymous with comorbidity. And frailty, certainly there's overlap between disability and comorbidities, but frailty can occur in the absence of either conditions. And that's an important um, <clears throat> aspect to understand. If we just briefly look at the pathophysiological scheme of frailty relevant to surgical uh, issues, we see that the decrease in physiological reserve leads to a state of vulnerability and frailty, weakness, phys decreased physical performance, poor endurance, itself then leading to loss of resilience, increased hospitalization, increased post-operative complications, and overall um, impaired quality um, of life. <clears throat> so how do we diagnose frailty? Well, um, unfortunately to say there is no consensus. There's many competing um, metrics, most of which are different ways of looking at the same thing. And despite numerous consensus conferences, we have yet in the geriatric literature to arrive at one single definition uh, of frailty. And there are a number of competing ones which um, really over, overlap and can be used under different uh, conditions. So how do how we operationalize frailty in the general population, there's two main metrics. The uh, one that you see most often in the literature is the frailty phenotype developed by Linda Freed, who was initially um, at Hopkins, now is uh, at Columbia. And this she presented this over 20 years ago, and it's referred to as the Freed frailty phenotype. The other major um, way of looking at frailty was developed by Ken Rockwood, a Canadian out of Halifax, who developed the frailty index. These two metrics do not identify the same patients. There's about 60% overlap. And in geriatrics, there are over many, many different metrics which are in use, but these are the main ones. The other ones that you'll, you'll see and which we'll discuss a little bit this morning are the clinical frailty scale, the frail scale, <clears throat> you're familiar with assessing gait speed, um, et cetera. So focusing on the freed frailty phenotype, the most common one, in the ambulatory uh, literature, it's a physical definition of frailty and it has to do with five parameters, each which has its very specific definition. If you have none of these parameters present, you are non-frail or robust. If you have one or two, you are considered pre-frail, pre -frail, and if you have three or more, you are considered frail. And it's important to understand that there's a clear association between fra uh, frailty and the underlying uh, states of sarcopenia and depression using this particular metric. The cumulative deficit model, the frailty index model by Ken Rockwood, <clears throat> is more of a multidimensional uh, way of looking at frailty. Frailty in this way of thinking is related to age-related uh, effects of cumulative effects of general health deficits, whether they are laboratory uh, results, clinical aspects, psychosocial aspects, for example, if somebody uh, is unemployed, if somebody is single, if somebody doesn't have a large social network, et cetera. Frailty severity using the frailty index <clears throat> refers to the proportion of deficits an individual has from a non-fixed group of health variables, which can come from any of these health deficits, and generally more than 30 are assessed to develop the frailty index. Now, everybody gets a little bit worried to say, oh my God, 30 parameters, that's a lot. But in actual fact, every um, uh, interaction with a patient leads to history, physical findings, laboratory studies, et cetera, which are enough to generate the frailty index. In community living, older patients diagnosed as frail, they have a frailty index of more than 0 0.25, and there is a maximum. You cannot have an index of one. Generally, the risk of mortality is very high when you get to uh, above 0 0.7. The other major parameter that is used and much, more, much easier to use um, um, is the clinical frailty scale. This is a, um, a way of assessing 
functional status. Um, and it's a nine point scale ranging from very fit uh, to um, very severely frail with a stage nine, which refers to terminally, terminally ill individuals. And it's a visual analog scale, and it can really, it has to do with whether their uh, person is physically active, has any concurrent diseases, whether these diseases impact on their functional status, whether they're vulnerable and need help with uh, instrumental activities of daily living, uh, whether they can do their own activities of daily living or not, whether they need help, whether they're completely dependent, et cetera. And it is, um, accepted that generally stages one to four of the CFS are considered non-frail, mild to moderately frail are stages five to six, and seven to nine are frail, but generally nine is, is terminal. And so stages 78, seven to eight refer to severely frail individuals. The uh, CFS has been studied in diverse clinical settings, including inpatients, clinic patients, the emergency room setting, various uh, surgical uh, areas, and in um, other conditions, including persons with HIV, and it, um, as as well as um, uh, diabetes and and other conditions as well. The CFS correlates well with both the Freed phenotype and the frailty index. And the important thing about the CFS is that it can be reliably determined retrospectively with input from obviously the patient, if that's possible, or from family and caregivers. And usually the retrospective um, state is what's taken about two or three weeks before the person uh, comes to um, surgical or medical um, attention. Now, the prevalence of frailty in the general population, again, it depends on the definition that you use, but generally over the age of 65, about 5% will meet criteria for frailty, regardless of the metric. Over the age of 80, there are about 30 to 40% of the general population uh, in the community are considered frail, uh, regardless of which metric is being used. Interestingly, <clears throat> the UK Biobank, which does many, many important studies, did a, an assessment of frailty in the general ambulatory population starting from the age of 35, and they used a freight Freed phenotype model. And what they showed that from 35 up to 65, about 5% of the general population meets criteria for frailty, and then obviously after 65, it will uh, increase. Regardless of which metric you use, what are the common consequences of being frail? Increased risk of multimorbidity, including geriatric syndromes and disability, increased risk of hospitalization, becoming malnourished, loss of independence, very important, increased risk of cognitive impairment, of course, like everything else, uh, increased mortality. Now, looking at the surgical literature, there are many different surgically focused frailty assessment metrics. They are all sort of... Um, based on the main uh, metrics in the general population, either the phenotype or the, uh, the frailty index. And the ones that I'm sure many of you are aware of and have seen them in the literature include the modified frailty index, which is derived from the um, ACS uh, and SQIP um, metric, and it's based on 11 distinct parameters. There's a triage risk screening tool. There's a trauma-specific frailty index. There's an emergency surgery specific frailty index. There's the PRISMA 7 and uh, the uh, risk analysis index, and there's others, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So even within the surgical literature, <clears throat> as there is in the geriatric literature, there's no consensus on using one uh, frailty metric under all that, that's appropriate for um, different uh, surgical uh, conditions, either uh, acute, uh, uh, leave admitted patients or elective, uh, et cetera. There are also some single item measures of frailty, which are easily done, non-time consuming, but they lack sensitivity compared with the multi-item metrics. And these you're familiar with, the slow gait speed, the timed up and go, and grip strength. I, I just put up here an example of the emergency general surgery frailty uh, index. And these are the parameters that are assessed and they're rather easy to assess. They can be done quickly. And this is one of the ones that is used to assess for frailty uh, in a, and patients admitted emergently to general surgery uh, teams. Now, there's also some difference between them. And you can see that in this um, uh, rock analysis, the um, 
the frail score um, was better than either um, an, the, another metric term, the share FI or the TRST scale um, in determining um, the strength of the association with um, one year mortality. <clears throat> A recent systematic review showed that frailty was associated with increased risk of all cause complications and mortality across all surgical complications, whether they were major complications, wound complications, um, reoperation risks, uh, discharge to um, loss of independence and readmission within 30 days. Being frail increased the risk of all of these. A, the modified frailty index um, is, was is associated with increased risk of adverse post-operative outcomes, <clears throat> whether it's any infection or specifically wound infection and obviously increased risk of um, mortality. Now, this, uh, this study um, uh, recently showed ver shows very nicely looking at 90 day mortality in older patients over 65 undergoing emergency laparotomy. And what it shows that if you just look at the age groups and look at 90 day mortality, the range of mortality from 65 up to 90 range from 15 to about 20%. But if you looked at the frail scale using the clinical frailty scale, from very fit to severely frail, uh, fit, the 90-day mortality range from 11% up to 50% of the most severely frail, showing that there was a, a, a more granular ability to predict um, mortality using um, the clinical frailty scale. And compared with other standard uh, surgical risk predictors, such as the Lee, um, the frailty index is uh, was better than this one in uh, the, this is a study from our own team here at, uh, at McGill, uh, Jonathan Afalalo's team looking at surgical uh, aortic valve replacement or TAVIs, that the frailty index was better than the Lee in predicting a 12-month um, outcome. And uh, the CSF itself is also sorted with uh, um, increased risk of, a, of loss of independence and in-hospital complications better than age um, in geriatric trauma patients as well. This has, uh, these have been used in a, num in a wide variety of surgical specialties after CABG. You can easily see that being the most frail, regardless of whether cabbage was done electively, urgently, or emergently, being most frail was associated with the um, uh, highest risk of poor outcome. Interestingly, more recently, there have been attempts to try to get away from the um, using scales um, which require some sort of physical activity. And a group out of Arizona, a group of surgeons and engineers have developed uh, the upper extremity mo motion uh, um, uh, system looking at gyroscope centers, which they correlate with the five freed um, frailty phenotypes and are have been using an immobile or bedbound patients. And it's just a gyroscope on the arm, just doing flexion and extension. And they have quite interesting evidence um, uh, showing that they can distinguish these parameters. They can distinguish between frail and non-frail uh, individuals based on uh, these results. And of course, electronic frailty indexes uh, are very popular. And you can easily develop these uh, preoperatively to, um, to uh, stratify patients into various uh, frail or non-frail categories. I just want to uh, mention that there are a number of non-geriatric uh, conditions which incorporate fra uh, frailty into management protocols. Both the uh, US and uh, the United Kingdom used the clinical frailty scale in its, uh, during the first wave of COVID to uh, manage uh, pneumonia. Um, obviously, uh, we're talking about perioperative surgical risk, which is using frailty, and we talked about the TAVRs. Also, but liver transplant uh, frailty has been used there to, uh, to assess risk for in patients uh, with end-stage liver disease. And as I mentioned, in other conditions, dialysis, diabetes, chronic inflammatory disease, uh, disorders, frailty is also being used to uh, stratify patients. So at this point, I'd like to turn, over, turn back to Dr. Pavoni to give you an idea of some very preliminary results of uh, what we've been doing here um, at the MUHC in um, Montreal General. Dr. Pavoni. So 
This just illustrates um, the distribution of geriatric consults among the surg surgical services at the MUHC in 2020. Um, as you can see here, a large proportion of them or are orthopedic patients and general surgery patients. So next slide. And so what we're doing um, at the moment is we're doing a retrospective chart review of orthopedic surgery patients admitted for fragility hip fracture and who are also seen by geriatrics. Um, and the goal is to assign a CFS score to these patients in order to determine how frailty affects postoperative um, outcomes. And as of now, we've assigned about 90 patients a clinical frailty scale score. And between the three of us who did the reviewing, there's been strong inter-observer variability, if you see here at the bottom of the slide, um, already at this point. So this is very encouraging, um, encouraging data. Next slide. And so this is some of our preliminary results. And again, um, because of the small sample size, not statistically significant yet, but here in yellow, you see that mean age is um, similar between the three groups and quite an old cohort. Um, and then admitted from home, you see, as expected, a large proportion of the non-frail patients um, were admitted from home, whereas um, below that, admitted from CHSLD, a large portion of the severely frail patients are admitted from a CHSLD, so as expected. And then below that, the mean length of say appears to be increasing as frailty increases. And 30-day mortality also increases as frailty increases with the largest proportion of deaths occurring in the severely frail group. This slide, again, just illustrates uh, mean length of stay. But what's interesting here is if you look on the left at age, uh, mean length of stay does not clearly increase as you go through the, the age groups, was there, whereas there's a clear increase um, kind of stepwise uh, throughout the CFS groups. So again, this is preliminary data, but it's indicative as we would expect that frailty might be a better an indicator than age might be. And then finally, an important outcome to look at is transfer to CHSLD and kind of loss of independence. Um, and there appears to be a greater risk uh, by odds ratio at this time uh, of transfer to a CHSLD if you're more frail, um, but not yet statistically significant. So once we have the tw 2021 data, hopefully this will be more clear. Thank you very much, Dr. Pavoni. So, all right, so now we've, I we've identified um, older patients as being frail, regardless of what surgical uh, area um, is being considered, and um, regardless of whether they're elective patients admitted electively or uh, emergency. So, what do we do with this information? So, first of all, um, a study a, a number of years ago showed that frailty not only was associated with increased mortality rates in high risk procedures, but also in low risk procedures as well. But the important part of this particular study <clears throat> is that there was a comment by Dr. Feldman and Carly from our institution, which said, all right, fine, you found frailty patients who are frail. Now is the time to act on it. And what is it that we can do? How should we approach these patients rather than just uh, identifying what can we actively do to try to mitigate these risks? improve frailty if possible, and hopefully that will lead to um, reduction in adverse um, outcomes. So <clears throat> what are the interventions that we can do? In the, in the uh, community population, um, resistive exercise and focused dietary uh, intervention supplementation has a clear benefit on reducing um, frailty levels and improving outcome um, markers in older, frail, um, ambulatory um, populations. A recent study looked at a comprehensive team approach in, um, uh, looked at survival in acutely uh, admitted surgical uh, trauma patients. And they looked at using the RAI score, the RAI score, they looked at survival according to different RI levels <clears throat> before they implemented this um, team-based approach to look at older frail patients and saw a very, as expected, very wide difference in um, survival depending on what your RI score was after they implemented their uh, team-based approach. The difference 
in, uh, in survival between the different rye levels was much less, showing a, a, a suggestion that a different approach rather than usual care could improve outcomes um, after identification of frail patients. And in another, uh, in trauma patients, <clears throat> again, they had a similar team-based approach in frail uh, elderly uh, trauma and emergency general surgery patients. And what they showed was that there was a decrease in a loss of independence. In other words, an, a, a decrease in the number of patients who needed uh, um, relocation to care facilities. And there was an, a decrease in the 30-day admission rate after their team-based approach. And where we're going now <clears throat> is that there's numerous, numerous um, advocates and publications which talk about surgical geriatric um, uh, co-management strategies. And this is just a, a very, you know, a, a, a little overview of various surgical publications which are recommending integration, integration of geriatric medicine and surgical um, principles to improve the outcome of specifically a frail um, older um, patients. Now there's a diverse implementation of how this can happen. And I use the, uh, the orthopedic literature to give an example of this because um, that's where most of the co-management programs uh, have been developed, certainly in the UK, which have been doing this for over 30 years. But a recent review um, uh, in the American literature showed reviewed what was in place in various uh, U.S. surgical sites. And, and there was a mixture of whether they had the true co-management models in which there is shared ownership between two services following the U.K. model, or many uh, institutions, actually the majority, had a traditional consulting model, which is something that we've, we've done here, but we, our team is trying to slowly move beyond that. And then, of course, there's mixed models depending on the um, logistics at each individual institution. Who are the consultant teams led by? Again, it depends on the availability of the expertise. They can be internists, hospitalists, as um, occurs in many US sites, or in geriatricians, um, but there's not that many of us, um, unfortunately. What do these teams consist of? There's no single model, and it depends on the availability and depends on the needs of the service that is that is being considered. But generally, uh, it would include a, an experienced and um, uh, dedicated uh, nurse practitioner or a clinical nurse specialist, a social worker, of course, physiotherapy plus occupational therapy. A pharmacist is is is, is very very uh, important member of this team, as it is a dietitian, and as well, community liaison is very important because um, the 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 outcome, the function, the quality of life of the patient doesn't end when they leave the hospital, either to return home or to, to go to um, a, a supervised setting. And, and this is obviously an area which clearly affects us, you know, at, at many Canadian and Quebec and MUHC sites, but where is this care given? And it can happen, as this paper focused on orthopedic cases, uh, patient, these patients can be uh, admitted to an orthopedic ward, an orthotrauma ward, um, <clears throat> a medical ward. Uh, they can be scattered throughout multiple units. Um, just to let you know that in Canada, at least most uh, geriatric, academic-based geriatric services are not, do not have wards anymore, and they have moved towards a consulting model, which um, is something that can be discussed at, um, at another time. And what are the services that are provided by geriatricians in this pre uh, perioperative setting? Well, there's obviously medical management with issues focused on older um, patients different from uh, who are frail. Uh, there's a focus on rehabilitation and what is the appropriate goals for the individual. Discharge planning, obviously, we know it has to start as soon as the patient uh, is admitted, but often there are logistics which uh, interfere with this. The, the issue of setting seal, ceilings of treatment is getting a lot of play in the surgical literature, uh, and there is some <clears throat> concern that frailty may be used as a surrogate to not offer 
um, specific or appropriate care. We have to keep in mind that diagnosing frail doesn't um, obviate doing what is appropriate for the person in front of us, but there has been some uh, some literature suggesting that certain very frail patients in, a, in certain specific situations, for example, with hip fractures, maybe adopt a non-operative uh, model, and there's some interesting literature um, that's, um, that's developing there. Uh, we can help with preoperative medical management. We can help interacting with community rehabilitation centers. And of course, uh, assessing cognitive function, assessing delirium and assessing the ability of the patient to participate in their own um, management. Using this uh, from uh, data from the UK, uh, I wanna point out that um, in the NHS system, it is mandated that patients over 65 be assessed and uh, for frailty starting uh, in the emergency room uh, if that's where, where they appear. In actual fact, this doesn't happen at often. It is mandated, but doesn't happen very often. And um, looking at how many, which surgical subspecialties actually use geriatric, um, have geriatric uh, management, uh, co-management uh, teams, Obviously, most of this is related to orthopedics with less than about 20% of these um, co-management groups occurring in other um, surgical uh, uh, areas. I'd like to finish off with, you know, what are some of the new developments in frailty management and the distance to just, you know, exercise and diet, which is effective. But the whole issue in geriatric is that we're moving now towards this idea of understanding fundamental mechanisms which can extend a lifespan or slow aging. What are basic underlying biological mechanisms? And there's a whole group of um, pharmacological uh, agents which are being slowly tested to try to limit this aging models. Mouse models, for example, are being uh, studied to better understand the biology of frailty and a whole class of drugs uh, called senolytics, to, which are aimed to uh, try to uh, minimize the chronic inflammatory component that occurs um, with aging and not to, to leave out the fact that there are a lot of very exciting new uh, potential drugs that will be used for sarcopenia, which as I mentioned at the beginning, is an important uh, contributor to the development of frailty. So to summarize, <clears throat> older surgical patients are at increased risk of frailty. Frailty is a surrogate marker for a biological age, which is a better predictor of risk than chronological age. Frailty increases risk of perioperative adverse events, increased length of stay, loss of independence, and uh, mortality. However, we're still in a situation where there's no consensus on which metric to use in specific surgical uh, conditions. However, adopting geriatric principles of assessment and management will improve outcome in early identified frail elderly surgical patients. And co-management principles, co-management models have been shown to improve outcomes and especially functional status and quality of life. We always focus on mortality um, as, as an important outcome, but to older patients, mortality is less important than functional um, status and quality of life. And more and more literature, surgical literature is starting to look at these aspects rather than on the traditional uh, outcome parameters. So I just, I want to leave you with this quote from a very respected surgeon from um, over a hundred years ago, which I think is very apt to the situation that we're discussing this morning. And I'd like to particularly acknowledge um, all my collaborators and coworkers uh, for all the extremely hard work that has gone into. Um, reviewing charts, um, multiple discussions, interacting with colleagues, and uh, hopefully we'll, um, we'll have more data. We're now starting to look at the 2021 data. So, so stay tuned. And I'd like to leave you with this, this final thought. Thank you for attention.
Thank you so much for that very comprehensive review of where things are at. Um, it is such, it's a field that has changed so much uh, in the past, uh, I guess, decade or so. Um, and uh, we have a question from Dr. Barry. Please go ahead, uh, Greg. Hey, Julian, thanks very much for your presentation. It was very Thank comprehensive, you. very easily understandable and clear. Um, and it's always a pleasure to work with you and your team helping care for our patients. I really do appreciate your help with our, our frail patients. Um, but you, you've outlined the various models. What's your vision for the best model here at the MGH and how do we get there? What do we need to do? Thank you for your question. Obviously, that's that's at the top of everybody's mind. Um, there is no one simple answer. Um, where we, our team, would like to head towards is a, a more um, interactive, um, more interaction, not only with, with your orthopedic team, obviously, where, as you saw by the, the statistic, that's where most of our consults come from, but also with other the other surgical subspecialties, where the limiting factor is, obviously, is personnel. Uh, and, and, and that, that has to, that is a problem everywhere. And it's a particular problem, uh, here, um, at, at the MUHC, but I think the starting point is the realization that certainly, um, in elective, um, surgical patients, that assessment for frailty. And I know that the prehabilitation program, you know, at the MUHC, it's a world leader. And, and obviously that, that is to be supported and to be used. Um, but there are many other patients who don't make use of that, um, who can be considered for um, preoperative assessment. And once they are admitted, or whether through the emergency room, um, to think about whether frailty uh, is present in older patients. And again, I think we, we clearly, I've made the point that we need to move away from age. You can be 90 um, and you can be completely independent and you will just sail through uh, very uh, difficult uh, surgery. So how do we operationalize this here? Um, I think given the limitations that we that we function under, uh, we do not have a geriatric ward at, at the present time, but I know we're all aware of the recent New England Journal article which said, where's the best place um, physically to, to look after um, uh, older uh, hip fracture patients, or older trauma patients, and an argument can be made either a co-management model on an orthopedic ward or on a geriatric ward. Um, but I would, what I would like to point out is that um, trying, uh, managing these patients on a medical ward is, is not really ideal because the focus there is not so much on geriatric uh, approaches and dealing with more acute medical um, issues. But this is an important ongoing discussion that we're gonna have for a while. Thank you, Greg. Can I ask a follow-on question, Julian? If you sure. don't mind. So, so I tell you what, uh, you know, as we as we face ex, you know really tight bed situations every day of the week, um, as well as uh, more towards case costing, the efficient uh, flow of patients into and out of our beds in the hospital is going to be absolutely critical to us continuing our surgical mission. Um, is there any discussions with administration right now to case cost? The addition of um, the the human resources that you've pointed out that we need hospitalists, dietitians, PTOT, et cetera. Has there been a move to case cost that to see if we can improve the overall flow and potentially improve our financial situation going forward uh, by increasing the human resources rather than just seeing it as a, yet another budget item that's going to that's going to cost us money? I, I cannot speak to that question, question specifically here uh, at the MUHC and, and the MGH, but I can tell you that the geriatric team at Mount Sinai in Toronto a number of years ago said to the administration, give us a chance, we will show you that we can save money and improve outcomes. And they did. They got support from the administration. They saved money. Uh, they have a geriatric ward. They have a very active geriatric consult service. Uh, the Brigham um, uh, just published uh, a paper where their geriatrics department is, com is, is 
interacting with multiple surgical subspecialties and they have shown improvement in an outcome parameters. So I think there's no doubt that um, very hands-on interaction clearly improves outcomes and saves money. That is starting to be clear. Mount Sinai has shown it. There's no doubt about that. I think it's a question of um, we have to sit down and, as you said, cost it out rather than following the traditional model. So I would, I'm would i very supportive of that approach. I'm happy to help you if you want to do that anytime. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Stein, please go ahead with your question. <clears throat> I think you're still on mute. There we go. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep, very well. Okay, thank you for an excellent presentation of a very, very important subject. Uh, I always introduce myself at these sessions as being uh, a radiologist, which I am, but I'm also a member of the Department of Surgery, which goes back to the Lloyd McLean days, mm -hmm. and I thank him for that. Um, interestingly, uh, on, on this subject of uh, the frail and elderly, um, one, of the, um, one of the procedures that uh, these patients fear the most is a colonoscopy. Uh, and, and in the department, we have developed a, uh, a preparation, and they fear the preparation more than anything else. So we have a uh, preparation for this age group, which we actually have labeled uh, the preparation for the frail and elderly for colonoscopy. Uh, and it's a very, very easy preparation uh, uh, that is uh, uh, excessive, really quite uh, tolerable for this age group. Uh, uh, but it's interesting that we use it for the frail and elderly. And I just bring it up because a lot of people don't know about this. Uh, uh, colonoscopy in this age group is not looking for polyps. It's not looking for precancerous lesions because those take, uh, as we all know, 10 years to develop. We're actually looking for cancers and therefore you don't need the preparation, the uh, stringent preparation that the younger uh, age group needs, the uh, colonoscopy screen, the colon cancer screening age group. So I just bring this up as a, uh, I was interested in this topic and uh, just to let you know that in radiology, we deal with the surgical patients who are frail and elderly, and and we and we pay spe we have special protocols for them. Uh, but uh, we have one which is, uh, as I mentioned, just uh, it's a preparation for colonoscopy, and it's, the preparation is called for the frail and elderly. Thank you very much. That's very very interesting and very exciting and very very good news for our older um, patients. Thank you. Um, Renzo, please go ahead. Yes, good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, Julian, thanks for that uh, very, very nice talk. I really enjoyed Thank this. You. Thank you. Um, you showed a lot of uh, evidence, uh, Julian, that uh, points to the value of assessing frailty um, in terms of outcomes. It uh, also showed several uh, scores and efforts to stratify frailty among different uh, specialties, even different procedures. Um, I'm wondering, in our institution, uh, Julian, do you, you know how how much use frailty scores um, have in uh, in our uh, clinical pathways? Uh, and first and secondly, do we have um, or can you recommend a frailty score that is simple to use? For, for sure, it needs to be simple or it won't get adopted, but simple to use and it has applications to multiple procedures, multiple specialties. Thank you very much for, for a very important uh, question. Um, the read frailty phenotype is a physical based um, assessment. It cannot be done on, on inpatients. You can't do gait, gait speed and grip strength, et cetera. Um, modifications of it can be used. The frailty index, especially if you have access to an electronic health record is very easily uh, developed. That's very clear. Um, that can be done uh, almost in instantaneously, and as I've shown you, is very, very accurate in predicting outcome. What we use, the clinical frailty scale, um, is, uh, I think, very interesting because it tells you not what the situation is today, because the patient in the emergency room, the acutely admitted patient, is going to be frail. It tells you what their baseline was uh, one or two weeks ago, and that as I've shown, is a very good predictor of outcome and doesn't take into account what the situation is today. The clinical frailty 
uh, score can be very easily done retrospectively. And as we showed um, in, in our study of the hip fracture patients, we had three uh, observers each scoring these um, uh, uh, 90 patients individually and our uh, inter-rater uh, variability was very, very good. We had a very, very good Kappa score, which uh, put us in the moderately strong uh, category. So this is one uh, set in the UK. It's the clinical frailty score that is uh, recommended, that is actually advised to use in all um, NHS hospitals. So I, I, I would personally go for this. And if you have an uh, electronic health record, the, the um, EFI can easily be done. Okay, great. Uh, Jean, please go ahead. Uh, really enjoyed your talk. And in transplant, uh, we try to assess our patients on dialysis who need a kidney transplant. And there's a few studies that have shown that no matter what the frailty score, uh, transplantation always comes ahead of staying on dialysis. Um, so we have an extensive database, and I was wondering what's the best way to reach out to you to see where we can set up some collaboration. Uh, our nephrologist, particularly Shefali Sandal, uh, has been uh, introducing frailty scores in our patients, and um, and this is uh, becoming more and more an issue as our patients are getting older who need dialysis and who eventually may need a transplant. So uh, how, how do we get together to, to see where we can collaborate? Thank you very much. That's a very, very important question. As I mentioned, dialysis is one of those non-geriatric areas where frailty is being assessed. And uh, in another transplant situation, liver transplants, also there's a, a liver frailty uh, index, which is published and used. Um, so if there's a member of the hepatobiliary team here, they, they can comment on it, but it's used uh, to determine um, risk uh, of, uh, of outcome pre-liver uh, pre, uh, transplant. And as to getting together and working on this, I, please, let's let's do it. Absolutely. Very much looking forward to it. I hope you don't mind, but I just put your email in the chat. So maybe of course. you can connect uh, by of email. Course. Of course. Um, uh, by the way, if, uh, make sure it's the MGH, not the MUHC. Th that goes into a dead dead spot. I put the, uh, Mag your McGill. McGill. Yeah, yeah. The, the McGill address. Yes, thank you. Um, I don't know who Wendy is, but Wendy, please ask your question. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Wendy Chu from the Geriatrics. Uh, some of you may know me from uh, other cheese <laughs> in the surgery world in the past. Um, I just wanted to follow up uh, on Julian's uh, excellent uh, comment uh, to Dr. Barry that there are certain things that can be done that are very low budget and that are actually mandated by our provincial government. And it's a program called La Proche à la Personnage, the elder friendly hospital concept. And basically, what it has to do from the moment the person rolls into the ER, that we attend to very, very basic elements of patient care, mobility, continence, uh, nutrition, uh, mental status, and particularly for us physicians and surgeons, appropriate prescribing to prevent a lot of the complications that then arrive, particularly in patients who are frail. And this is a program that already exists, very difficult to roll out because um, Everyone feels that it requires a lot of budget. Interestingly though, the RCTs that this is based on um, were actually done with trained volunteers. Uh, the tricky part here, of course, is getting volunteers who like to work with the elderly, but it does not necessarily mean a huge increase in budget um, to at least make sure that the basic care needs to prevent delirium, to prevent deconditioning, can happen in all of our patients across uh, across uh, all specialties. Thank you, Wendy. Very, very important to remind us about that. Absolutely. Thank you. I mean, this also sounds like maybe this should be something that is integrated into the, uh, you know, education of all our residents and all the surgical subspecialties, you know, maybe even in terms of the competencies or at the Royal College level, you know, because it's it sounds like it's come to the point where we need to do, I think, more 
education around this topic, just to make sure that surgeons are aware of some of the things that they might, I mean, obviously this one, these rounds are a start, um, but perhaps we need some more deliberate um, programs on this, or even, you know, a module for, um, for all of our surgical residents on sort of surgical care in the elderly or something like that. Maybe that's also something we could potentially think about collaborating on, uh, Julian. Thank you very much. That, that's actually a really important point. And uh, just for because of time considerations, I didn't go into, but there are a number of um, combined publications by formal um, surgical teaching organizations, which clearly mandate um, a surge, uh, exposure and following um, geriatric uh, principles and integrating geriatric principles into the care of the elderly patients. I can certainly uh, make those available, uh, and I apologize for not showing them, uh, but this has been around for a number of years, uh, both in Canada uh, and in the U.S., and certainly um, in the U.K., uh, where there are formal recommendations for uh, surgical trainees. Great. Yeah, please do send them. I think uh, we'll definitely look into that. Um, are there any final questions or comments for Dr. Palutz about this uh, really interesting and important uh, topic? I don't see any more hands and I don't see any more questions in the chat. A uh, comment from Christian about, a, a, again, great presentation on an important topic. So thank you very much again for um, for taking the time to present this topic. And for, again, I think many of us have expressed our appreciation in working with you and collaborating with you on taking care of these patients. So um, see you in the uh, in the corridors of the Montreal but, General. And, thank uh, you very much for, for this opportunity uh, to, to share this with you. And I look forward to, to further collaboration. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.